thank you, Chris. Um, one of the great things about ideas is the way in which they coalesce, come together, uh, and become more interesting and more important as they join forces. Um, and sometimes just because they're funny. Um, I was thinking when Clive was talking just now uh, about Australia and being dirt by sea, my children never got that right. They always said it was dirt by sea, um, which living in Western Australia never seemed all that wrong. Um, so does people power hold the key to the future? That's the title of this talk. Um, the short answer is yes, um, but that's not the whole talk, luckily. Uh, yes, people power really does hold the key to our future, and the reason for that is because there is no other form of power. As the Arab Spring demonstrated in 2011, even oppressive regimes are only able to stay in power so long as the people acquiesce to it. Once the people withdraw consent and refuse to participate in, uh, any further in their own oppression, then that regime's power vanishes. So therefore, the most important political question has always been, uh, but it was only raised first by Spinoza, why do people fight for their own oppression? Now, this is not the question that I'm going to ask here, but it is worth keeping it in mind. The Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, and before that, for those of us older than 11, um, the anti-WTO movement from a decade ago, as well as the various coloured revolutions, all resonated globally because they made manifest the fact that people power still exists in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. And that evidence is compelling. Everywhere we turn, it seems, people power is being extinguished. And I'm not just talking about oppressive regimes in far-off countries. I mean here in Australia. Now, why do I say this? Because one of the most crucial instruments of people power, namely the democratic election, is, in some senses, losing its validity. How many of us can honestly say that any political party in Australia represents our views completely. If I was a Labor supporter, I wouldn't endorse their funding model for higher education. If I was a Liberal supporter, I wouldn't endorse their funding model for higher education either. And I imagine many of you feel the same way. My point is that in voting today, it often feels like a choice between the least worst of two bad options, rather than an affirmative choice for something that you believe in. And of course, that was what made Obama great. He promised change and hope that you can believe in. Whether he delivered that or not, history will judge. And that is undoubtedly the reason why political parties in Australia, but elsewhere as well, are struggling to form majorities in their own right. With the loss of this clear mandate to govern, their ability to think and act for the long-term benefit of the country has been put under pressure. Increasingly, funding for, increasing funding for universities would be good for the country, no one seems to dispute that, not even the Liberal or Labor parties, but apparently it isn't the kind of policy option that would get you elected. Clearly this is an interested example in as much as I'm an academic working at a university reliant on government funding, but one could easily think of other examples. Climate change springs to mind, but I didn't want to be provocative. The point I want to make is this. Democracies are complex assemblages of competing interests, ideas, ideologies. It is impossible for an elected government to represent every single interest, and so therefore it has to be selective. But that doesn't mean we have to agree with its choices. It does mean, though, that if we disagree with its choices, then we have to make use of political instruments other than the ballot box. And that is why the Arab Spring, the Occupy movement, and so on, were so invigorating. In their different ways, both demonstrated that there are potent forms of political expression beyond the ballot box. Perhaps most importantly, they both demonstrated that people are not as hopelessly apathetic as we fear they are. Mind you, I was living in the UK at the time, during the course of the Arab Spring, and what we had there, rather depressingly, was riots in London with people stealing iPhones and brand name clothing, uh, not demanding political change. So, what are the options beyond the ballot box? Now, before I answer this question, let me set the scene by asking another question. What was the most important change that occurred during the 20th century? To put it another way, what is the biggest difference between the 20th century and the one that came before us? Now, probably the first thought that springs to mind is technology. Aeroplanes, cars, the internet, and so on. They didn't have any of those things in the 19th century. But my question is, did they really change things so much? 
It is true, they didn't have cars in the 19th century, well, not for most of it, but they did have horses. So private mobility was possible, albeit at a much slower pace. They even had that most contemporary of problems, pollution. There were apparently more than a million horses in London at the turn of the 20th century, uh, and the stench apparently was considerable. But at least it was recyclable, I guess. They didn't have aeroplanes either, but they did have ships. So transatlantic commerce was possible, so was transatlantic travel. Uh, luckily for us, otherwise Australia wouldn't be the country it is today. They didn't have the internet either, that's true, but they did have mail order shopping, they had pornography and they had gambling, these being the three main things for which we use the internet. Um, <laughs> you just had to leave the house to get it. Uh, which from an exercise point of view to get to later talks is probably a good thing. Now, one might also point to medicine. It was certainly much more primitive in the 19th century than the 20th, particularly following the discovery of penicillin. But much of what we take for granted about medicine today, such as the training of doctors, government-funded hospitals, even the very idea of disease, was a product of the 19th century. So if it's not the internet and it's not penicillin or any other technological invention you might want to think of, then what? Well, I'll give you a hint. Imagine being transported back through time from the present to, let's say, 1820. Uh, what aspect of your everyday life that you take for granted would be missing? Now, I'm directing this question particularly at the women in the room. What was the most important change in the 20th century? Women's rights. The greatest invention of the 20th century wasn't technological, it was political. The 20th century will be known as the century of rights. Rights, like citizenship, like elections, like the state itself, are political instruments, and they had to be invented. They also had to be made real. That, feminism, that is feminism's contribution to history. In the 19th century, women weren't allowed to vote, nor could they become doctors or lawyers. Indeed, for the most of the century, they couldn't even go to university. They weren't allowed to marry without their father's permission. They could not inherit property. Uh, mind you, these two facts combined gave rise to some of the greats of English literature. Without them, we wouldn't have the Brontes or Austen, so perhaps it's not such a bad thing. Um, similarly, women were not equal before the law. They were paid less than men, and if they got married, they could be sacked. Uh, and that was true in Australia until the 1970s. So any woman today who says she's not a feminist isn't paying attention. Today, no woman would expect or tolerate her contribution to society being discounted on the basis of her gender. In the 19th century, this was routinely the case. In fact, in Britain, there were certain pompous parliamentarians who said women couldn't be allowed to be given the vote because what if they had PMS on election day? Uh, they might not choose rationally, they might choose on the basis of their body. More than anything else, what feminism did that so transformed the world is it made the demand for equality normal. It made normal for women to demand equality in every situation, to demand that legislation be changed accordingly. It became normal for women to say from a woman's perspective and for that to be taken seriously in the construction of new legislation. Now, inequality hasn't disappeared by any means, but the justification, the need to justify the demand for equality has certainly um, been put to rest. Now, that is a big idea, equality. The incredible thing about women's rights is that it took until the 20th century for it to become accepted. How did men manage to rig the game against half the population of the planet for so long? Now, there would be a research project. Now, feminism set off an avalanche of demands for equality. Shamefully, uh, in one instance, Australia didn't grant citizenship rights to its indigenous people until 1967. More positively, though, it did subsequently enact anti-discrimination legislation that protects all people from being discriminated against on the basis of age, race, belief, sexuality and so on. These changes are ongoing and as I said, inequality persists, but the demand for equality is here to stay and that is the 20th century's most important legacy in my view. So, what is my big idea? I want to propose that we need a right to the city and this right would amount to the demand that equality be taken into account in every aspect of city government. This means interrogating the city's philosophy, what is its underpinning rationale, on what basis does it make decisions, what are the factors it takes into account, what is its vision for a perfectly designed and managed city, how would we know it was doing a good job, 
This goes well beyond community consultation because it questions the very rationale of the city's governance. Ultimately, it wants to say that the people who reside here get the opportunity to say what they mean by flourishing. How would we bring that about? I don't know. But let me say this. We don't know how to cure cancer, but we don't want anybody to stop trying to figure that out. We don't know how to have equality in a city, but why should we stop from trying to figure that out? Thank you.